So, um, yes, here I am again. And <laughs> you have to imagine someone smarter and more, uh, more organised looking. Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's very, you know, it was great when, when Lindsay sent through this because I just thought, oh, it just, if, if some of you were kind of boggling your minds about chemicals and the way they work and everything, this does, um, this will be helpful. So Lindsay wanted to talk to you today about Barbara Hepworth's radical use of artificial patina on, on bronze sculptures and to discuss some of the dilemmas that arise when treating her outdoor sculptures. Um, I have to say, this is based on Lindsay's practical experience. So um, to understand artificial patination, it's useful to look at the natural coloration of bronze first. Bronze is an alloy of copper and produces a range of colored compounds when it reacts with the environment. Brown and green are the most common colors to see. Brown forms first, like the penny on the left. Then bronze turns green after longer exposure to water and oxygen. These images of Rodin's kiss are to show the progression of a sculpture outdoors. It may start with the traditional brown finish, but after many decades outdoors without maintenance, the sculpture will look more like the one in the center. The image on the right is to show the contrast with a sculpture that has been well maintained. It has still changed, but it is aging more gracefully. The green in the middle could be more accurately called corrosion rather than patina. The surface of the metal is dissolving away, and the black and green streaks are visually disfiguring to the form. Artificial patination can mimic the effect of exposure outdoors, but much more quickly. Instead of leaving a sculpture out in atmosphere for months or years, you can achieve the same effect in hours. It starts with cleaning the bronze. You can see the stages of this on the left. Uh, or does she mean the right? Can't see from here. Um, the top left shows investment from the mold still clinging to the surface. Sorry, I have a problem with left and right. No, she has got it right, hasn't she? It's me. Um, so yes, that's the top left. Um, so the investment from the mold is the sort of white stuff that you can see um, clinging to that. This image shows the bronze after sandblasting to remove this, and at the bottom, fine abrasive surface finishing to create a more reflective finish. So that's the three slides on top of each other on the left. Reactive chemical solutions are then applied to the surface, which can be done either hot, like the image is shown, or cold. So um, that's where you see the blowtorch there, which is heating the bronze. A huge range of colors are possible using different chemical mixtures. Further effects can be created by layering different colors and concentrations. Patterners may not just be chemical. Foundries may also add colored waxes, inks, or pigments. Whereas most artists have used chemical patina on bronze as an all-over treatment in the past, Hepworth is less bound by tradition and uses the technique in a form far more inventive way so that she can use color as freely on her bronzes as she does with her other sculpture. Unlike many artists of the time, she communicated closely with the foundries she worked with, encouraging them to produce new and specific colors for her so that she could achieve the effect she wanted. She then sometimes worked on these patterns herself when the foundry returned them to her. So this is, um, there, there is documentary evidence for this, which um, I should have mentioned in my talk actually. Um, most of the sculptures shown here are intended for display indoors, and so they remain in good condition, provided they are well looked after. So yeah, there's a pretty good range of different finishes on those. But what about the sculptures meant for outdoor display? Hepworth used some extremely unusual colours and effects on her outdoor bronzes, and it is difficult to think of another artist at this time who was colouring bronze in such an innovative way. In these early images of three obliques walk in, you can see some extraordinary stippled effects with green and white patterners that no one else was using at that time. These have been sharply contrasted with the reddish brown edges and highly polished inner surfaces of the rings. But to look at these measured, oh, oh hang on, I think she means me to go to the next slide. Yes, so same sculpture after years of weathering. But to look at these weathered versions around 45 years later, you would never know that those colors were there. The archival images shown in the previous slide, so I'll just go back just to show that contrast. 
are therefore enormously important to help us gain an understanding of artists' intent. Similarly, these early images of four-square walkthrough give us tantalizing information about Hepworth's original radical color scheme. Although the color values of the slides vary significantly, and again, you know, that going back to Laura's point about the photographs, um, and you have to kind of be aware of the different film and different effects. Um, it is possible to see that this sculpture was originally patinated with contrasting colors on each face. Green and black at the base with brown, green, and maybe white or pale green at the top. The inner surfaces of the rings have also been polished. In the second slide from the left, you can see one of the patinators from the foundry putting the finishing touches to the sculpture in Hepworth's garden in St. Ives. Um, can you? Where's that? Can you spot it? I can't. Oh, right. Yes, it's got. Oh, yes. Yes. Very difficult to see. Yeah, and it does look kind of white at the top there. But. Um, after years of display, these casts have become more uniform so that the contrasts are barely visible and many of the original colours are gone. After exposure to weathering, all the original coloured compounds have changed or worn away. So different casts, same thing mm -hmm. happening. For conservators, it is important to understand what we are dealing with and many of us are used to thinking that the answers to this lie in chemical analysis. However, the results of this can often be disappointing as they can be obscure and difficult to interpret. In truth, learning about practical processes can be far more illuminating. Sometimes the best way to really understand something is to do it yourself, which I would totally endorse as my recent patinating experience um, proved. Lindsay started out her research into artificial pat patterners by interviewing a number of foundries as part of her MPhil research in the late 1990s. Much of this process, the foundry process, is shrouded in secrecy, but some people would... Is that my own phone ringing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'll just leave it. <laughs> uh, I, anyway, apologize. apologies for, to Lindsay for that. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so Lindsay started out her research into artificial patterners by interviewing a number of foundries as part of her MPhil research in the late 1990s. And much of the foundry process, as we've been discussing, is shrouded in secrecy. But some people were generous with their time and knowledge so that she could see the process of artificial patination taking place and learn more about the chemical recipes used. Armed with this information, she then carried out a lot of experiments so that she could find out how the process works in practice. Here are some of the tests that she has carried out over the years. At the bottom are some of the most recent tests she did in collaboration with Tessa, uh, to replicate the appearance of Hepworth's white patterners based on archival information. Okay. Aside from practical treatments and archival research, we may also learn a lot through the treatment itself. Uh, here's, yeah, sorry, I think that's it. here's a treatment Lindsay carried out with Laura, and te uh, Laura Davis and Tessa Jackson, um, who have both spoken, on the cast of Four Square Walkthrough in Tate's St. Ives in collaboration with Tate Sculpture Conservation Section. The sculpture had been well maintained over the years, but the surface appeared more un uniformly green, and the rings were now tarnished to a dark brown, as in earlier slides. Before this treatment, the team consulted the early images of the work, and talked about how it might be possible to reinstate some color contrast using reversible tinted waxes. With a sculpture in such good condition, chemical repatination would never be considered as it is too permanent. However, the cleaning revealed that much of the original color scheme was still there and that it had just been obscured by layers of wax. Here you can see the removal of old wax with steam and then the process of warming new clear waxes into the bronze surface to saturate the colors so that, in the end, no tinted waxes were necessary. As a final stage, the inner rings were repolished and lacquered in close consultation with the artist's estate. An unexpected benefit of the treatment was that it was suddenly easier to see the artist's intentional textiles, which is um, textures applied with various tools, which is what Laura showed us earlier. Um, the hammer mark um, is one. This is to show you walk through in the St. Ives garden before and after treatment. The pale colors visible in the original images at the top of the sculpture had weathered away, so it does not look the same as the original, but perhaps it has been brought closer to the artist's intent. 
We know that Hepworth periodically had the rings on her sculptures repolished while she was alive, and that she also asked for some of her white patterners to be reinstated. She obviously understood that her sculptures would weather with time, but it is difficult to know how far she would have wanted us to go in those cases when all colors and contrasts are lost. In the end, I think that we have all found with Hepworth, the more you look, the more you see. Observation without assumption is crucial. In the last few years, we have combined close observation of surfaces revealed by cleaning with archival sources and have learned a great deal more about the subtlety of Hepworth's use of colour on her bronzes. The images above show you some examples. It seems that we cannot assume that brown was just brown. Sometimes brown was combined with green, as in the images on the left, and sometimes with the underlying gold colour from the bronze itself, as in the effect seen on the right. So I hope all these can be clearly seen. Um, Lindsay hopes we can spread this information more widely amongst those who have these sculptures in their care to help inform for future treatment of all of Hepworth's work.